Amen. Go ahead and turn your attention to the screen. So you're really can't punch. You want more proof? I haven't done the with salt thing in a while. That's all right. I believe you. I just, I don't understand why you choose me. You want to change the world, son. So do I. Almighty, oh my goodness, it's so hilarious. And oh, see, see Carol, right? Is that the actor? Oh my goodness, is that his name? Or, uh, yes. yes, yes, okay. I just want to make sure. I think he, I think it's the most funniest thing. But we're going to be talking about Noah, okay, and the ark. And um, as a part of this new series, you guys, that we started last Sunday, Dudes, Duds, and Divas, um, really the heart behind this series is really to showcase Old Testament characters. Um, in, in the, their real life situations, uh, learn timeless principles that they have experienced and how we can uh, apply those principles in our lives. Do you know that there is not one person um, on this planet or there's not one single thing that you have done or experienced that another person hasn't experienced or done before you? In other words, the pains, think about your life, the joys, the highs, the lows, everything that you have experienced on this planet Earth, someone else has faced. A betrayal, jealousy, victories, uh, wars, broken relationships. And the beauty about the Bible, which I love, is that it has all kinds of nuggets that we can learn from and many examples that we can glean from and grow in our relationship with God. That's why we encourage all the time, read the Bible. Because when you read the Bible, you become involved in God's word. You begin to see the stories that they're alive, that they're not the, some dead stories, but they're alive and they're anointed to teach us. Amen? So let's do that this morning. Let's go ahead and grab our Bibles and open it up to Genesis, okay? Genesis chapter 6. Go there with me. If you don't have a Bible, please stop by the back and grab this Bible for free. Grab it for someone else. If you, don't, if you know someone else doesn't have a Bible, they can have it. It's free. It's on us. We want to make sure everyone has one. Also, grab these notes. Okay, got them? Everyone raise, these, raise your hand really high if you don't have them. Okay, if you don't have notes, we want to make sure you got some notes so you can fill it in. Well, hey, you'll notice I titled my teaching, Build It God's Way, because there's no other way. God's way is the best way. And the dude, I like saying that. I get to say dude in church. How many like to say dude? Okay, yeah, dude. It's, it was a popular word like in the 80s. Dude. It's like everything you said had dude before it, right? Dude, are you going to go to the car? Dude, are you going to... Anyways. Dude, this dude, this man of God, Noah definitely built it God's way. Well, what did he build? Well, the greatest boat of all time called the ark. 
Up here on the screen, there's some pictures. Fire them up here. This is kind of uh, uh, some pictures of what it could have looked like, the ark. There's just some models. Um, there's a lot of different ideas out there. But I, what I want you to see is the size of this boat. We're talking about a massive boat here. And I can only imagine the people around Noah during his time in uh, day and age, and they probably thought he was crazy. Like, you're going to build what? How many have crazy uncles or crazy aunties? Okay, be honest. Every time you're around them, they have a crazy idea, and you're like, uh, we're not going to do that today. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, let's do it. But then you realize that they're partially drunk or they are drunk, right? <laughs> Don't do that. See, no, I had this crazy idea, but it was actually God's idea. And sometimes our idea is the crazy, the crazy, the better, because then God, God wants to, to do something crazy. And I, I think in this situation, Noah, they're probably asking him, you want to build this boat that's going to be 400 feet long, 70 feet wide, 40 feet tall. It's equivalent to a 22,000 ton boat today. And Noah, and we're going to see in the story, he's like, yep, that's right. God told me to do it. And so I'm going to build it. Let's pick up this story of how it unfolds in Genesis chapter 6, because I believe it's worth our time and attention just to kind of go through this story and allow the word of God to soak in us, okay? Starting with uh, verse 9 of chapter 6 of Genesis. It's up here on the screen as well. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at that time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Shem Ham, and Japheth. Noah, or now, God saw that the earth had become corrupt and filled with violence. God observed all of this corruption in the world, for everyone on the earth was corrupt. What's happening? God is heartbroken. His heart is aching over humanity. Only but one man and his family, check this out, is worshiping God at this time. Out of all the millions and billions of people, only one man is righteous. Now, it's interesting, verse 12 is alluding to verse 5 in, in this chapter 6. Check it out. It's up here on the screen. It says, the Lord observed the extent of the human wickedness on earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he had ever made man, and he put them on the earth. And what does it say? It broke his heart. And because God's heart was broken over human wickedness and seeing evil prevail, he decided to do something unimaginable during this time. Let's pick up the story in verse 13. It says, So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along the earth. He's talking about people, animals. Now you might be thinking, why would a loving God do this to his creation? Really God, why would you wipe out the entire planet human race except for one man and his family? Why? I think we all have those questions. Would you agree? We all come to those points in, in our relationship with God and our faith at those crossroads where we go, okay, I don't get this. And, and for me, I, I think about, I, I don't have the answers. My, my mind is limited in thinking. I can only think so much compared to God's ways, right? Because his ways are not my ways. But what I do know is that there's a reason for everything in God's plan. I do know that he doesn't tolerate sin and evil. Sin and God's holy presence do not intermingle. They don't go together according to the scriptures. Uh, we, I also do know where, where sin grows, violence escalates. I mean, just look around in our world today, right? Why wars? Sin. Why mass shootings? Sin. Why death and violence? Sin. Nothing new is under the sun. It's, that means that man's heart will always gravitate towards pride, 
selfishness and what they want. That's our natural tendency as human beings. And so we need to trust the Bible. During Noah's time of evil, that God in his infinite wisdom knew it was time to start over with one dude, guy, and with one family. Again, we can come to many conclusions of what we think the flood was and what we're going to read about. But we have to believe and trust that God knows what he's doing. That he instructs Noah to do something bigger than himself. Let's pick up in verse 14. God said, Noah, build a boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. And then construct the decks and stalls throughout its interior. This is how you are to build it. Make the boat 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, and 40 feet uh, high. Leave an 8-inch opening below the roof on the way around the boat. Put the door on the side, build the three decks inside the boat, the lower, the middle, and the upper. Look, God says, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of each kind of animal, male and female, into the boat to keep them alive during the flood. What was the purpose of that? God's like, hey, we want to make sure we have a male and a female so that we can reproduce on earth, right? Because that's how God made us, male and female. So he's like, hey, I made animals the same way, male and female, so they can reproduce. All right, I just wanted to say, add that little note in there. Be sure to take on board enough food for you and your family and for all the animals. Verse 22, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. And if we continue to read the story, and I encourage you to do that, do that the next chapter we, we discover, true to God's word, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, covering the whole earth with water for 150 days. And the only people who survived was Noah and his family. Think about this. Put on your thinking caps. The whole earth was covered with water. We like water, don't we? <laughs> We love the water, the sea. But can you imagine the whole earth covered with water? Hello? Am I just the only one that's fascinated by the word of God? Oh my goodness, if you don't got a boat, you'd be drowning. Now, I know some of you are really good swimmers. You show me your skills. I've seen you paddle out there. I've seen you catch a wave here and there. But we're talking about 150 days worth of water. You be drowning until the sharks find you. Hello. Supernatural stuff. I'm just blown away by God's word in the events that happened on this earth and how God uses just normal people like you and I to fulfill his plan. And even as I just said that, you may be thinking in the back of your mind, this is some sort of, man, I didn't come to church to hear some crazy man-made fairy tale. I came to hear the real deal. Because honestly, at first glance, we can assume that this event really did not happen. In fact, how can this scientifically happen? The earth, the axis, think about it. The gravity pull would, would have been all out of balance. And the earth would have crumbled from the inside because the water was everywhere. How in the world? Family, we're talking about a global catastrophic, like a, a catastrophic events, right? It's crazy. There's no logical way around this. But we know by faith with God, there's always a way. There's always a way. Let's go back to Noah. Through his eyes, he saw what could be because God said so. He believed. And what I love about him is that he simply obeyed. He put into action what God said to do. God told him to build a boat, so he built it. And not only did he build it, but he did it God's way. See, if you're going to build something in your life, make sure you're doing it God's way, not your way. Amen? When you build it God's way, you're going to experience many, many blessings because you're doing it His 
way. Family, I thought about this. It's one thing to have faith in God, but it's another thing to put into practice what God told you to do. That's called obedience. And so for the rest of our time, what I want to do is, is really discuss why building it God's way matters. I want us to see what we build in our lives every day matters to us, our families, our marriages, our communities, our job places. It matters. And it leads me to a basic question, if I may ask you this morning, a simple question. What are you building? What is the it in your life? Is it a boat? Is it a house? Is it a career? Is it a position at work? Is it a big bank account? Is it that I win the lottery tomorrow? Yes! <laughs> is it, what is it? You fill in the blanks because the truth of the matter is, we all know this, we're building our lives on something. Think about it. Is it God's will or is it your own will? Is it your own desires or is it God's desires? Basic questions. What are you building? Now, if you're not quite sure, if you're still asking that question, I want you to know you're, you're, you're in good company. God promises to show us each and every step of the way. He, he might not give us the whole deal, meal deal, but he'll show us one step of the way. And to help us more, in your notes, I wrote down for us four practical things to build whatever it is God's way, because I know your heart is to build your life on Jesus, okay? In your notes, just write these down, just a few practical things. First step is this, develop a faith posture. Develop a faith posture. But we learn this from Noah, right? He did exactly what God told him to do. In fact, he, it says that he did it and he obeyed what God's commandment. Was it bigger than him? Absolutely. Was it a crazy idea? Totally. Could he do it on his own strength? No way. He needed God to come through big time. He, he needed a miracle. And that's what faith is. Depending on God to do it when it doesn't make sense. Have you been there? Doing something when it doesn't make sense. And that is so true of us family. If we want to build upon what God has said, it must start with faith. How we posture ourselves in faith will shift us from right uh, doubt to belief. It will shift us from fear to courage. Amen? It, it, the faith in you will do mighty things. And Noah shows us that a shift of faith will always be required when God speaks. A verse that I love, it's here up on the screen. Let's all say it nice and loud together. Ready? Go. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you believe? Because that's what it's going to take. Childlike faith. I, I sense that this morning that the Lord wants us to return to that childlike, innocent faith. Just to believe in your Heavenly Father. Do you believe? Personally, for you, I want you to think again. What is the it that you need faith for? A new opportunity, a job, direction in ministry, a new relationship, a big risk, starting school. Maybe it's a vision that God gave you. I am so excited for the limbs, for Joe and Catherine. You guys are back there. Can't you guys raise your hand? It's okay. We want to notice you, acknowledge you. We, I am so excited that the vision that God gave them, that, it, would you say it's pretty big, huh? It's bigger than yourselves. It's like, it's out there. But what I love about you guys, you guys are starting small. You're saying, you know what? God gave me a vision, and I'm going to have faith. I'm going to do what he said to do. See, all of us have these visions at moments, and, and, he, and it requires faith. Now, if it's a crazy idea, because I know a lot of you are crazy out there. Go to the Lord with that. Because, you know, everyone around you might think you're crazy. But if it glorifies Jesus, you're on the right track. Amen? 
<laughs> That's a good way to test your vision. Is this going to glorify my Lord and Savior and bring people closer to him? If you're heading in that direction, your vision is lining up pretty closely what God wants you to do, to give Jesus glory. Whatever it is, family, it will always require, require courage to trust on your part. Now, now, please do this with me. Use wisdom and discernment, right, in all things, in all decision making. But never let overthinking, over-rationalizing, future casting, what God said to do stop you from moving forward. I've known so many people, they pray about it, they pray about it, they seek counsel, they seek wisdom, which is good. I encourage you to do that. That's why we're a family. That's why we're a church. Don't make decisions on your own. Talk to somebody. The Holy Spirit's in them, and the Holy Spirit does speak through us. We gain wisdom and discernment through each other. But when you get all of that, when you pray about that, stop overthinking it. Some of you replay over and over what is going to happen, what is going to happen. Or stop over-rationalizing it, right, and use these crazy feelings or, or excuses to come up with it. Just do it, right? Or future casting. I'm right there. Can I be honest with you? I future cast. Oh, my gosh. I worry about tomorrow. What's going to happen if I do this? What, if I take this step, you know, then what? And God says, no, 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 no. You stop doing that. And just do what I told you to do. Move forward by faith. And that's what Noah shows us. He didn't hesitate. He just started hammering. Started cutting wood. Okay? That's the first step. Develop a faith posture. That it starts there. You got to believe. Do you believe? Okay, the second step. Follow the blueprint God gave you. Genesis 6.15. This phrase stood out to me. God told Noah specifically... This is how you are to build it. God told Noah, cut the wood here to this amount of feet, hammer the nail here, uh, seal up the cracks in the bow with tar along the, 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 the seams, place the animals in this spot, and so on and so on. That's what I love about God is that he's in the details. Now, I know, because I've been around long enough, that you may not know the full picture, but, but God promises to give you bits and pieces along the way. For some of you, I really believe God has told you to do something for him, and you may even feel like it's bigger than yourself. It's bigger than you. In fact, he showed you the blueprint. It may seem a little fuzzy, a little bit unclear, but you know it's God. And you're thinking to yourself, how in the world am I going to get from here to there? Am I the only one? How am I going to get from here to there? God, you told me to do this, but I am not quite sure of the details. What I love about God is that he already has the details all lined up. It's already planned out. Our job is just to walk in it by faith. Trust, 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 trust. You know, I know for me in my life, because this wouldn't be real if it wasn't real for me in my life, right? Or practical. I know for me, I knew that God was calling me to be a pastor, and that's all I knew. I graduated high school, and, and so I went to do an internship for one year. I served. I gave my life away. I asked the Lord, what are you doing with my life? And then the Lord said, I want you to go to Bible college for four years. I'm like, okay. I go to Bible college because that's, that's what my mentors told me to do. So I'm going to Bible college. And, and I knew God was calling me to do that. But I only had $200. How are you going to pay for college with $200? My son Xander, Xander, $200 doesn't go far in college, right? I mean, come on. How in the world is this going to happen? Well, God says, hey, if I called you to it, I'll take care of the bill. And he did. Heather and I graduated from Bible college with no debt. Praise the Lord. Okay, we do another faith move. We go to Colorado. We go to Hillsboro, Oregon. We go to Seattle. All of these faith moves takes us around the country. We've been to many places around the world, and it's crazy. And God, all he, all he told me along the way, along this journey, and, and it's still true today, just take one step at a time. Just take one step at a time by faith. And family, I want to express to you my gratitude. Never in my wildest dreams I thought I would be pastoring in Kona with beautiful people like you. 
Man, I'm just a scrawny little kid. Well, actually chubby little kid. <laughs> from Arizona, eating tacos and Mexican food. I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd be in Kona. How many know what I'm talking about? How, how do you get from here to there? And you go like, how did that happen? Think about your life. How? What? I met who? I have kids with who? What? I'm marrying who? What? How in the world did I get from here to there? It's crazy. One, one word fills my heart. Thankful. I'm blessed. I'm thankful. It takes faith, family. I've been praying for you this week. I really have. And perhaps you come back to this question that you're not quite sure what the plan, God's plan is. Here's my encouragement. Write this down. Simply do what he last said. Yeah, I know. You come to church and that's all you get right there. <laughs> Simply do what he last said. Yep, that's it. What was the last thing he told you to do? And then do this. Stay faithful and then do this next step. Keep on doing the next right thing. Can you do that? This leads us to the next step. Step three, walk with integrity. Walk with integrity. This is what I mean. Integrity uh, means doing the next right thing, especially when no one's looking or watching. It's those decisions that are made in the street secret only God knows about. That's what counts. And for Noah, I believe a lot went along, went along in his head and in mind when God told him to build the ark. Literally, he had to change the way of his thinking before he came to the point of obeying. Because everything in his time and culture around him encouraged him to do what? Evil. To please oneself. Genesis 6, 5. Again, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. It doesn't say part of the time, all the time. Noah was like a fish swimming upstream going against the flow. The Bible says that he was blameless among his people. No one was righteous except for Noah. And when all odds were against him, he kept obeying, making one decision after another decision, doing the next right thing. That's integrity. Now, sure, he probably didn't feel like it was convenient in the moment. <laughs> but how many know doing the will of God is never convenient? Noah, year after year, building the ark. <clears throat> Some scholars say 120 years or 80 years. Can you imagine building an ark that long? A boat? People looking at you going, like, you crazy. Nail after nail, boom, faithful. Nail after nail, boom, faithful. It's not convenient, but I'm going to do it. Faithful. 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 See, our faith is not built on convenience. It's built on on conviction, right? Character, commitment, your heart. This is what God's after. And he saw Noah's heart. He saw his faith. Have you been there, family? Doing the next right thing? Especially when the, it's not convenient. <laughs> oh, man, I know I'm speaking to some of you. It's like pulling the sword out of your heart right now. <laughs> I know many people who may agree with God about what he asked them to do when it's only convenient. But that's not obedience. That's not obedience. Obedience is doing what God asks when it's not convenient because you know it's the will of God. There's a difference. Amen? In other words, I may not feel it, but I know it, Therefore, I do it because God said so. Does that make sense? You don't go based on your feelings. You go based on what you know God told you to do. You never make a decision. I, I, in fact, I, I just, this is just a side note. Never make a decision on your feelings. People make big time decisions in their life and they're like, well, do I feel happy right now? Well, are you going to feel happy? Or, or, or I feel sad. Or never base a decision on how you feel. 
only what God tells you. Amen? Can you do that? Because if you do it God's way, I'm telling you, there's going to be some rewards. There's going to be some things fulfilling in your life. Okay, this leads us to the last step. We're going to fill this in. I like this one. Lay claim to the promises of God. Lay claim to the promises of God. For Noah, the, promises, the promise was a generational covenant for all people. We're here today. If you believe the Bible is true, I asked you, do you believe? You said yes. Maybe you said no. We are here because a generational covenant was extended to one man in his family, Noah. It was God's, and God promised Noah through a sign. Anybody know what that is? A rainbow. We're familiar with rainbows here in Hawaii, yeah? We love rainbows. I love rainbows all, every time it rains and you see a rainbow in the sky, you're just like, oh, up here on the screen, check out these photos. Uh, Damien sent these to me. Uh, fire them up here, these rainbows. Isn't that beautiful? That's a double rainbow over Kona. Okay, and then there's another rainbow where he went camping, and there's another rainbow out in the sea. Rainbows everywhere here in the Hawaii. Whatever happened to the Hawaii rainbows? Well, why did we change the name to Warriors? Rainbow Warriors? Oh, we're Rainbow Warriors. I'm sorry. So we're not we're Rainbow Warriors. Yeah, so that's so cool. Rainbows. Okay. God says, hey, I'm going to give you a promise, a sign. It's going to be a rainbow. Well, what, okay, let's read the word. We're going we're gonna to wrap this all up, okay? Genesis 9, 9, 15. It's up here on the screen. It says, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures and every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. I like this. Whenever uh, you see a rainbow or a rainbow appears in the cloud, I will see it. And I will remember an everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Beautiful picture of God's promises. So when we see a rainbow, it represents God's promise that he'll never judge the earth again with floodwaters. It also represents God's presence. I know for me it's so true. There's something special, beautiful. When I see a rainbow in the sky here in Hawaii, it reminds me that God's presence is with me. It's also a covenant of relationship. That God says, you know what, I'm, I'm never going to leave you and forsake you. Now for us in Christ, for, you know, fast forward thousands and thousands and thousands of year la years later, the work, in the, the work of the cross and what Jesus Christ has done. For us in Christ, we have given many promises to claim. And this is not an arrogance, but this is our God-given right as children. We are forgiven. We are the, the righteous heirs of Jesus Christ. We are filled with God's presence. There are so many promises to claim, not, in, again, a prideful way, but a humble way, saying, God, thank you, because I would never have this if it wasn't for you. All of this is because of what you have done for me. So I, I humbly receive, I lay claim to those promises in Jesus Christ. I want to pray for us as we wrap up our time. I'm going to invite the uh, worship team to come on up. And I, and, I, and I really feel like the Lord has been speaking to us through the Bible. Don't you love the Bible? Do you like these stories? Okay, I do. Okay, someday when we get to heaven, we're going to zoom out and we're going to be in heaven. And I'm going to say, Lord, can you take me back to when Noah was building it and the animals came in? I want to be there. Okay, I just want to be the grunt man, you know, shoveling stuff. Anyways, the Bible is loaded. I want to pray for us, okay? And um, I, I really sense this morning as, as we conclude our time in prayer that a lot of you know God has told you to do something. Uh, it, and it's definitely bigger than you. Maybe um, you're not quite sure what it is. And you're processing it. And this morning, God wants to remind you that he's with you, that he, he's going to encourage you. He wants to... He wants to catapult your faith to another level, that you know that your faith continues to grow, that you don't stop growing just because you come to know Jesus. Every day your faith keeps growing to trust and trust, to trust, to trust, to trust. So that's what God wants to do this morning. He wants to develop in us more faith to believe what he told us to do. Now, secondly, I feel like, secondly, there's some of you, and this is where I want to be gentle, and the Holy Spirit wants to be gentle this morning. There are some of you that you feel like you blew it. God told you to do something, and you didn't do it his way. 
you did it your own way. I know. I get it. May I encourage you. The heart of the Father, God is not angry with you. He loves you. He loves you. In fact, he loves you so much. He will always give you a second chance. We're talking about a God, a creator of the universe who spoke the world into existence, who created you in your mother's womb, who loves you and says, I want to give you a second chance. It's called grace. Grace. In my study, Genesis 6, 8, up here on the screen, I want you to, your attention to go there. It says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This verse really is the, the catapult of what God was really trying to show humanity. And then what's even better in Hebrew, due to wordplay, the word grace in Noah spelled backwards is grace. The two letters that form in Hebrew, you'll see it there, the ne and the chat, the chat and the not, all of those form the word grace. Noah's life represented the grace that God wanted to pour out onto the earth. So I thought of us. If we want to do it God's way, it's going to take grace. Family, it's going to take grace available only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You want to serve God with all of your heart. You're going to need his grace. You're going to need his grace to help you get through it. What did Paul say? My grace is sufficient. Or Jesus said that to Paul. My grace is su sufficient for you, Paul. I'm going to get you through this. So whatever it is, if you need a do-over, man, let me tell you, do-overs are cool in God's kingdom. We believe in do-overs here at Hope Chapel. It's called grace. So if you need that, it's available this morning. If you're in a financial crunch, hey, listen, there's time to start over. If your marriage is on the rocks and it's shaky, God can use it to redeem it and turn it all around. He can use it. If something was stolen from you, precious, God can heal it and restore it back to new. So it's never too late. Never too late. I want to pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. As we close our time in uh, attitude of worship, Lord, we open up our hearts um, to your spirit. We open up our hearts to what you want to tell us this morning. Lord, I know that you've already been speaking to us through your word, through your scripture, through these stories of old. Lord, your word never gets old. And so, Lord, I pray that faith may arise in us. Um, that you would illuminate your scripture to us this morning and that our hearts would be changed. Father, develop in us more faith, more faith to believe that you are a miracle-working God. Nothing is impossible for you. Help us believe that when, when we are with our families, when we're having dinner with each other, when we're at home, when we're in the workplace or in the job place, wherever it is, Lord, help us to believe that you exist and that you want to move mightily in our lives to showcase your glory. It's all about you, Jesus. We get out of the way and we put you front and center. Lord, heal our hearts. Restore us. Revive us. Lord, as we close this time of worship, we give you our song, our praise, in Jesus' name. If I can have everyone stand to your feet, we're going to close our time in just a, an anthem, a praise of worship unto our Lord and thank him for all that he has done. Man, I, I know we're going a little bit late, but I just sense in my heart as we're worshiping, God gave you a vision. He 
gave you a vision, maybe not at this moment, maybe he has, but you know he's given you a vision. He told you something. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I, I, I want you to have the courage. Keep, keep them high. Don't be ashamed. I admire your faith. I admire your faith. Is it crazy? Okay, it's probably God. You're not crazy. Keep your hands up. Church family, you see everyone with their hands up? Do you see everyone with their hands? Can you just extend your hands to these people? Because they need encouragement right now. They, they need encouragement right now because they need a God to come through. They need a God to show up big time and remind them that they are not crazy. So let's pray for these people. I just sense this before we, as we close our time. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for each other. God, you call us to pray for each other, and that's what we do. God, as we lift up our brothers and sisters who have these visions, God, these, these mighty big visions of you, God, I ask that you would encourage them. Give them courage to see it through, God. Lord, they might not know how they're going to get from here to there, but God, you do. So Lord, I pray that you would encourage them, give them a peace of mind, that you would provide, Lord, what they need along this journey, that you would show up big time. God, I know my brothers and sisters. I know their hearts. Their hearts are to give you glory. And Lord, I pray that that would always be front and center to give you maximum glory for their lives. Lord, we love you. We, we give you the praise. We thank you for prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church family, go out with the peace of the Lord and vision. He's speaking to you. God bless you.